Hello and welcome. Uh, this session is entitled Keys to Building Machine Learning Systems. My name is Garrett Smith. Um, I am a software engineer. So I'm going to be talking about uh, two sort of topics here, data science and engineering, systems and software engineering. I am in the second camp, to be very clear. Um, my uh, work as of late, though, has been very much in the middle of these two. So um, a few years ago, I founded a company called Guild AI. It's an open source company. We do open source tools for machine learning engineers, uh, but really do, we do tools for data scientists as well. And over the years, I've developed some experience. Uh, most of it has been very good, um, positive. A lot of it though has been <laughs> frustrating. Um, so I have, uh, I think, some hard won points of view uh, that I'm gonna be sharing with you uh, as a result of that work. Um, I also founded Chicago ML. We're a, a fairly large community in Chicagoland area of machine learning practitioners and enthusiasts. Uh, you can read the rest of my background there. It's primarily operations and, and systems, uh, distributed systems development. Okay, so I don't have time, unfortunately, to get into any kind of machine learning tutorial or even a, even a short introduction. So I'm gonna leave you with this and then move on. <clears throat> machine learning lets you do you, uh, write software that you could not possibly write yourself. Um, it's been sort of off the charts hyped uh, over the last several years. And usually when things get hyped, they go away um, because they can never uh, sort of stand up to the hype. Uh, machine learning is not one of those things. Machine learning is a, is a quite a substantial method uh, that really does work. Um, the problem is that um, it's very difficult to adopt. And so I want to talk a little bit about adoption and some of the problems there, and then spend the rest of the time talking about what I feel are some sort of keys to successfully building machine learning enabled systems. Okay, so earlier this year, O'Reilly uh, released a sur the results of a survey on AI adoption. Now, AI in this case is sort of, I'm using it as a proxy for ML. Um, you'll see AI used quite a bit. If it's used in this kind of context, it's usually a marketing ploy. I'm sorry, O'Reilly, that's what this is. Um, really concretely, we're talking about machine learning methods uh, in, in, in software and, and systems development. Okay, so this is interesting. Um, this is, these are enterprises, so 85% um, evaluating, and this is 2020, and 15% doing anything. Now, for a number of years, I was seeing numbers that were like, you know, a, th we have a, we have a third of our projects are machine learning, not, not quite maybe, but like, I don't see that in the field. And this feels quite a bit more accurate. 15% um, doing anything feels about right to me based on my, my intuition for whatever that's worth. Now, interestingly, 50% of the respondents consider themselves to be mature adopters of, of AI. Now, 15% of them doing anything, which suggests that, at least 35% of these people are, are possibly stretching the, the definition of, of mature, but to each their own. Um, they listed challenges to adoption as, as the following, and I've listed the top four, which comprise the, the blind share of, of challenges. Institutional support, use cases, so that is finding a, a valid use case, an, uh, an ROI-driven use case for machine learning. Uh, lack of skilled resources, and lack of data. These are, these are very common. You'll see these listed as barriers to the adoption of uh, machine learning in an organization. Um, but my presentation here uh, is not about those things. It's about the things that follow. So I'm gonna assume that there's institutional support and I'm going to assume that there's a solid business case. So we have juice. We're gonna build some machine learning systems. Um, now what? So what are the problems? <clears throat> the problem, first of all, is not data. This is often cited as sort of the problem of ML. You know, we need data, we don't have data. That's a problem of degree. So we always want more data to get better results. But this is not a fundamental problem to doing this work. Neither is the problem of having the latest libraries and tools. I say this because it's, it's shocking how common it is to see people looking to tool vendors like Facebook and Google and Baidu and uh, et cetera, to come out with sort of some magical pill or bullet that will all of a sudden make this stuff magically work. 
and it's magical thinking and it's not science. So this is not a problem and it's not what I'm going to be talking about. So you're not going to get nuts and bolts or gearhead content in this. I'm going to be talking about what I think are some fundamental structural process problems related to this work. Okay, so this is something I see literally 100% of the time in typical organizations. <laughs> so it's a little bit of a loaded statement there. You don't see this problem in mature, actually mature organizations doing machine learning, like a Google, like a Facebook. Um, these are, are typical sort of historical remnants of data science emerging out of a CFO business analytics role. Um, and you see the data science community and the engineering community, and I'm talking about software and systems here, as being sort of discrete, separate bodies and have different cultures associated with them. So I want to talk a little bit about the culture here. So this is a fairly complex graphic. I'm not going to get into a lot of the details. Um, I want to highlight the general differences between data science and software engineer. And these are preponderances. They're not hard, fast rules. Um, data scientists tend to work by themselves um, with limited co collaboration. There, again, there are exceptions, but I have seen most of them follow this rule. Um, they are typically focused on generating reports or notebooks. So they don't typically put their code into production. <clears throat> the expected outcome of their work is entirely uncertain. And this is a key point. Data scientists are engaged in research and development. They don't know what they're going to get at the end of their work. They hope to get something useful, but often they don't. That is very different, as we'll see, from software engineers. Um, and the quality measurement as a result is often non-deterministic. So you don't necessarily know what is good all the time, what is passing and what is failing. So most of the folks here at GoTo will be in the software camp. So I'm not going to belabor the points of software engineering, but software engineers are used to working in teams. Uh, software engineers ship production, hopefully production quality, production code. Um, expected outcome, absolutely certain 100% of the time. Absolutely. There's no uncertainty in the software development process. Well, there are, there are some cases. Uh, hopefully, though, with enough precision, in theory, it can be precise. Now, humans can you know, take precision and do what they will with it. It is very different from data science, which is not, it is not precise. No matter how finely tuned and specified you get, your outcome is not known ahead of time. Um, and, uh, and quality measures for software are usually deterministic. They're usually pass-fail tests, very simple assertions. You can write a lot of them uh, and have very, very robust tests, but uh, these tests are comprised of small, uh, highly deterministic um, processes. So this is an actual quote from a Guild AI data scientist. 70 to 80% of my code is thrown away. When I heard that, it completely changed my point of view about the integration and the problem of integrating uh, data scientists and engineering work. This highlights how different the, the work is fundamentally. And no tooling or process or really anything uh, can, can, can simply address this. This is a, is a tricky problem and it works its way into code and it works its way into the processes uh, the, mo the effective processes that generate that code. So this is a problem. Here's another problem. So I'm going to give you a big splash, a big wall of content here to just absorb. And the background for what I'm about to go through is in the near ubiquity of, of, of sponsors underestimating the complexity of machine learning or data science integrated in the software development process. I've, ne I've really I've never seen anyone who fully appreciates all the things that are involved up front. And it's always a matter of, of, of sort of gently and maybe not so gently educating along the way. So, so here we go. So let's start with data. So data consists of three parts, data acquisition, cleansing, and feature engineering. I'm not going to get into feature engineering. It's an important component that allows a data set, which is the result of this, to be the most useful possible for a machine learned process. That's the data set. The model. There's the model development phase, which um, is, can be as simple as taking something off the shelf and reusing it, or something as complex as, as a novel, uh, you know, publishable, research-worthy um, innovation. Someplace in between is generally where things fall. 
um, but there's a lot of coding and experimentation that's involved in that. There's the actual uh, training of the model, and this is generally if you picked up a tutorial along the way, so TensorFlow, PyTorch, Keras, Scikit-Learn, generally you sit down and you start to train right away. And you start to train right away because you have this juicy, wonderful data set that is going to train beautifully and give you a nice result every time. Um, the reality in production systems is this data set um, usually doesn't exist. Um, even if you've gone through all of this work, uh, your data set still isn't quite there. Um, you're not getting the results that you want. So uh, the model training is almost anticlimactic. You know, it's just sort of grinding through the realities of things. Um, Finally, or not finally, uh, at the tail end of, of model training is the evaluation and test. Um, and there can, that, that can be, depending on how, uh, how robust you want to be, that can be quite involved. And then depending on where this thing is going to run, you may have a model optimization phase. So if it's running in a constrained environment, resource constrained environment, you want to address um, size and performance characteristics of the model. So all of that, all right, you get a model. Now, each of these boxes, the gray boxes, represents substantial engineering, data science, and coding effort. And they're all unique to machine learning. There's nothing here that wouldn't be here or that, that would exist here if it weren't for machine learning. So it's all necessary and it's all because of machine learning. So there is no just, oh, we're just going to do machine learning here. This is a substantial... Uh, sort of fixed overhead for doing any of this at all. Even the simplest models require all of this. Sorry. All right. Underlying this. Okay, that's, I'm not done yet. You can see there's a section of the bottom that is not yet revealed. All right. So underlying this are methodologies to actually run the stuff. So we've just built the stuff. Now we're going to run it. Okay. So we're going to uh, deploy the model. So it could be a mobile application or, or server-side application. There's complexity in, in both of those platforms. Uh, we need to monitor and detect issues. And for, for machine-learned models, this can be completely non-trivial. It could be per performing wonderfully, but you could have some sort of wretched bias. Um, we'll see uh, momentarily uh, an example of that. Um, there's all sorts of things that can go wrong in production uh, related to monitoring a system that looks perfectly fine but isn't fine at all. Once you've identified the issue, how do you fix the issue? Well, in, in software, you reason through the code, you debug the code. It's usually pretty deterministic. Uh, not so much in machine learning. Uh, depending on the complexity of the models, you may have a real problem on your hands, and it may be, a very, it may be challenging to fix the problem. Uh, there are some well-known cases of, of AI or machine learned models being pulled completely, projects killed because of the complexities involved in what I'm talking about here. No one's going to do machine learning after this talk. They're going to be like, this is just not worth it. <clears throat> no? no? All right. Uh, remember, 15% are actually using it. That could, there could be a reason for that. All right. Ongoing releases. So you've done this once. All right. Now, how do you do it again? How do you, how do you upgrade a model? Uh, how, do you, uh, how do you version models? Um, so there are issues here. And at the end of the day, you have a production system. And again, there's nothing here that, well, I guess the underlying section there, um, those are common, deployment, monitoring, uh, debugging, and releases. But anything in the gray box is novel to, to the machine learning uh, use case. Okay, so I believe the problem here is process. Not data, it's not tooling. Um, you know, I'm assuming there's some degree of will and budget to go do this. And once you have all that teed up, then you got yourself a real process problem. So let's talk about the keys to addressing this. This is the payoff. So that's the pain, and now we're gonna have all of the wonderful solution to that pain. Hopefully, hopefully this will, will land as common sense, though. I think most of it is. Okay, key number one, unified data science and engineering teams. So, uh, there are three parts here in order of uh, simple to most complex. So the simplest thing would be to embed the data scientist in a software project. And that probably makes sense to a lot of people, but it's kind of rare. Uh, data scientists often are off on their own, you know, either solo or small team projects, and they uh, have these kind of odd artifacts that they'll hand off, a notebook or, or some other thing that they expect to land in production. That's really quite a nonsensical way to build software. Um, it's not sustainable. It, it just, I can't say enough bad things about it. I'm sorry. Data scientists, you need to be embedded 
in your software team, you need to be a part of that team. Um, if we get to the point, when we get to the point soon, when we can return to on-site uh, environments, um, I would consider co-locating. So you're not just down the hall or in a different building, you're actually you know, right there in the same you know, physical space as the software team. Um, and then the, the third one, which I think is, is big, is to look at organizational change where the two teams are actually, two functions are actually reporting up the same uh, organizational structure. So, okay, number two. Um, use software best practices. Software is an emphasis here. Um, the data science best practices is, it's not really a thing. <laughs> um, I don't mean to be, I guess that's kind of rude, but um, it's not to say there aren't best practices. I just haven't seen them coalesce around a general set of adopted best practices. So each individual might have a best practice, but it's not like software. Software has best practices. So my short list here, we have iterations, um, automated build and test, so continuous integration, um, this idea of joint code ownership. So it's not his or her code, it's not my code, it's everyone's code, and we all have a joint sense of responsibility for it. Um, and then sort of the, the traditional tooling and processes, revision control, linting, code forming, and that kind of thing. This is very standard. And I think that data scientists could, could benefit tremendously from slipping into that environment and adopting these best practices. Not now, I'll say this, that those practices don't accommodate all the things you're going to have to deal with with data science. But you have a much stronger starting point within the software arena than you do with the data science arena. Okay, identify model success criteria metrics. So what I mean by this is we want to know when the model is, what, what does it mean for the model to do well? What's our, ba what, what's our most you know, fundamental baseline of performance? So we can't go to market, we can't release this thing until it does this. And right, so that's our sort of minimal viable model. And what would our, our hugest upside be? What would be you know, state of the art or breaking state of the art be if we could achieve that? That's a game changing model. To understand what these are early on will drive the work much more effectively than not doing that. And it's shocking how often this is not talked about. And then measuring progress and measuring regress are actually quite different things. There are multiple axes, axes that run through this problem domain. You can have a model that performs very well from an accuracy standpoint, um, but performs terribly from a bias standpoint. An example is you'll see um, very frequently, um, it, it's a, just a big problem given our data. Uh, models, uh, facial recognition models um, are skewed toward lighter, uh, pr predicting uh, more accurately on lighter skinned individuals. And this is something that's come up time and time again. So you, have, you can have an increase in accuracy, but it's biased toward a particular segment of the population. So while you're getting more accurate, you're also getting more bias. So you're in one direction, you're pro progressing, in the other direction, you're regressing. Talking about these different axes and understanding what they are and getting to measure them early on in the process is critical, I think. Here's why. My information comes, my sort of instinct and intuition comes from from software and the importance of, of, of tests and using tests to establish correct behavior of a system. And if you don't have those tests, you don't know if your system, you don't know how your system is behaving. And the analog to that applied to machine learning is how should this model behave? They're not the same thing, but they are really getting to the same point. And so identifying these success criteria early on is a way for a team to have sort of a flavor of test-driven development in their project for models. Solve a simple problem first. A lot of times there's an instinct within data science communities to go into a cave and come out with the finished product. It's a bad idea. I think that you should deliberately create a model that is not the best model. It's the simplest possible model that you can think of that will work. And you get that into your system, your automated system, your development environment, in your release environment, in your test environment. And you, you use that to drive an understanding of your success criteria. You use that to drive your automation. And ultimately, you use that as a basis for continual improvement. And with that continual improvement, you can chart going from the minimal viable model 
on up to hopefully the game changing model. Okay. Automate end to end. These are some of these are very similar. They're, 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 they're distinct keys, but you can kind of get a feeling here that these are all related. And, and if you're your regular go to attendee, you've, <laughs> none of this should be terribly surprising. Um, I'm focusing on the things that I have seen in projects that will make the difference between a project that struggles and a project that, that does the very best it can with, with the data and, and state of the art um, in models that, that, that are available. So automate end to end on day one, day one, week one, whatever, however, however long that takes. So what we want to get to is a change to the model code can be, traced all the way through and pushed through to deployment and integration. This is continuous integration, this is continuous deployment. It's just applied to models. Um, you want improvements to be incremental and visible forever. Or you don't want to have to go into a cave and emerge and have some big integration problem or some big refactoring problem. You want things to be slow and steady and progressive and visual and, and, and visible. And you want to encourage confident experiment, experimentation and refactoring. So here's the motivation. Right. I think I, I think my commit fixed the issue. I wonder what it broke. I literally ask this question every, on every commit, every commit I make, this pops into my mind. And I think, I think, well, thank, thank goodness for all the tests I've written. But then I also think, well, maybe I should add some more tests. Maybe I should, should reason about this before I actually make this commit. And this applies to data science as much as it does to anything else. Data, data science and model development are not exempt from this problem. Any single solitary code change you make to all those boxes, all those gray boxes, any one of them could break something. And if you don't have measurements in place, you don't know. And it's as, it's as toxic and as, and as, and as uh, punitive on a project as any other bug introduced by, by a software engineer. So if you're gonna do the ML, please use these practices to catch the problems with the model as much as you would with the other code. My last point. Um, ongoing refactoring with tests. Now this sounds like the previous point, but it's not. What I mean here, when I'm, I'm, the focus on this is, is on the refactoring of the code. The code that data scientists will write for you will not be the best code you've ever seen. And this is not in the slightest bit a derogatory statement. Of course it's a derogatory statement. I just said their code is terrible, right? But here's my point. There are structural reasons for the code being the way it is. And I, you know, if, if you doubt that, what you should do is you should sit down with a data scientist and watch him or her program and write this code and think about how you would do it. And you will run slam head first into this problem. The methodologies that work well for software engineering don't, don't really work naturally or that well for data science, um, especially in the exploratory mode. Um, it's the reason that notebooks are so popular. It's the reason that you see huge, sprawling um, sequential code, um, global variables, reused variables, all sorts of anti-patterns. Um, there's reasons for that. I'm not saying it's good code, but there's reasons why it exists. Now you have a problem. Do you put that in production? The answer is no, you don't put that in production. <laughs> you, you need to fix it. And so the question is, how do you fix it? And I think it's important to develop an open and honest culture around refactoring. And here's my uh, suggestions for strategies. You can use pair programming. Um, you can backfill, meaning you allow the uh, data scientist to ship whatever he or she is, wants to ship, and then you sort of selectively improve the code. And you do that with open communication. Um, and, uh, and then there's this arm's length um, code adaption uh, pattern, which would be take the code, wrap it, and monkey patch it so it works. Uh, and I've done all, all three of these, and depending on the environment, um, you, might, you might want to pick one um, or, or not the other. <clears throat> okay, finally, you want to track every ML experiment for audit and comparison. And uh, this is just a fundamental, um, I think, non-negotiable requirement. If you're going to be doing this work, you need to track it in the same way that software is tracked um, from a revision control standpoint. Experiments are revisions to the code, and they should be tracked. They don't go into to GitHub, well, they could, but generally not. Uh, but you do need to track them and you use that information as a part, as a continual improvement process and, and, and you use that to debug and audit the model. Okay, so that's it. 
<clears throat> here are the uh, keys. To summarize, we want to unify the data science and software engineering teams. Uh, we want to apply software engineering methods to data science. Identify and measure success metrics up front. We want to solve a simple data science problem first and use that as a basis for improvement. Automate and, and build and test pipeline on day one. And finally, we want to encourage and support ongoing refactoring um, supported by automated tests. So, so these are the keys. And, and to sort of summarize this, um, what we're looking for here is uh, to apply our experience uh, wisely and to get the two sides of this coin to work together smartly. And so these are some suggestions, I think, based on, based on seeing this a lot, that I think would, would sort of pave the way to a successful relationship. But ultimately, it comes down to good communication, being honest with one another, um, so being truthful, you know, speaking the truth, um, and working together. And, and, and if one of these suggestions doesn't make sense, don't use it. Um, figure out what works best for a team. But um, I think identifying this sort of dichotomy and split and the importance of bringing this together is probably the central tenet, the central, the central theme of this presentation. So with that, I uh, have some resources here which will be available uh, for ongoing discussion uh, on the slides. And uh, I assume here we'll have some discussion. This is a recording. Uh, but um, if, we, uh, if we can't talk in person, we can certainly have a discussion on uh, one of these uh, lists. And there are others as well. But you can reach me mm, on any of these, any of these slacks. Yeah. So. With that, um, I've practiced my, uh, my stopping here, so I'll do full screen, stay safe, um, and uh, enjoy the conference. Thank you.